This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. Nature is full of mysteries. And when you're out hiking a trail in Missouri, you're surrounded by clues, if you know where to look. Tracks on the ground, markings on trees, a distinctive bird call, all of these can lead an inquisitive naturalist to the joys of discovery and just a little more understanding of the incredible, beautiful mysteries around us. But there are limits to what we can discover with just our basic senses. And in the world of mycology, the study of mushrooms, it means getting down to the DNA. To talk with us about the mushrooms of Missouri and how you can be part of an ongoing effort to identify them, I'm joined by Mike Snyder. He's the Mid-Missouri President of the Missouri Mycological Society. Mike, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really glad to be here. So, Mike, we're going to talk more about this effort to collect DNA from fungi. But first, I want to know a little bit more about your own journey to mycology. How is it that you got interested in mushrooms? Right. So I get asked that question a lot. Um, I have been into mushrooms for about 15 years at this point, uh, very much focused on the mushrooms that occur here in Missouri. I first got into mushrooms because I had a lot of health issues uh, throughout my 20s, and I started to uh, change my diet, and that kind of led to an interest in foraging in general. So I started to learn about all these edible plants that were good for me and medicinal plants all around, and eventually that led to the discovery of fungi. Uh, One of the first times that I even noticed a mushroom was uh, on a hiking trip with um, our children when they were younger, and we had sat down for lunch, We looked around the hillside we were sitting on, and there are all these strange-looking black things sticking up out of the ground. And Mm. my kids had been really into uh, identifying, you know, snakes and lizards and plants and flowers, and they had a mushroom pamphlet uh, from the Department of Conservation. And they said, Dad, we know what these things are. They're called black trumpet mushrooms, and they're edible. We saw them in our pamphlet. And I was looking at these weird black things and going... I don't think those are food, you guys. I don't know about this. And they said, no, we we swear, Dad, we know what we're talking about. And I said, okay, well, let's gather them. We'll take them home, and I'll look into this more closely. And, of course, I was very skeptical. Uh, I'd never even considered eating a wild mushroom. Got home, looked them up, looked at their pamphlet and a few other resources, and said, well, you're right. They are these black trumpet mushrooms, and they really wanted to try them. So we fried them up and ate them. And I tell you, that was a perfect introduction to the world of culinary wild mushrooms, black Mm -hmm. trumpet. Trumpets are delicious, and it was just really fun to find them. So from that point on, uh, it was just I I really delved deep into fungi, learning as much as I could about every aspect of them, Um, really geeking out kind of by myself in the woods. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'd like to invite our listeners to this conversation. I think many of them will relate to some of the things that you've been talking about, Mike. Are you feeling the effects of Missouri's shroom boom? If you love fungi, tell us why. Give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. You can also send us a note on X at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpr.org. So after you had that first experience, Mike, then you have come now after 15 years to being part of the the Missouri Mycological Society. What is it that this group does? So the Missouri Mycological Society is dedicated to spreading awareness about fungi uh, in all its different aspects. So we host uh, forays, which is kind of like a a guided mushroom hike where folks go out in the woods and learn about all the mushrooms that we find. Uh, We have those basically every weekend throughout the mushroom season, uh, which is most of the year. Uh, We also do several uh, kind of special mushroom-focused events throughout the year, from culinary-focused events to learning how to cultivate mushrooms to weekend-long mushroom forays. Mm -hmm. And recently, you were interviewed in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch where you talked about some of those forays. And what you had said, and I had referred to that in the the call-out for engagement, is that we're in the middle of a, quote, shroom boom. What do you mean by that, Mike? (laughs) <laughs> yes, the shroom boom. Uh, the first time I heard that term was from my good friend Jay Justice. Uh, it's basically a nod in the mycological community to the sudden upsurge uh, in interest of all things fungi. 
Uh, like I said, I was just kind of by myself in the woods. I didn't really know any other mushroom people, and I even maybe thought they didn't exist. <laughs> uh, but in the last few years, there definitely seems to be a, a, a huge increase in public interest in all things mushroom. I mean, you go to the store and there are mushroom toothbrush holders and uh, everybody's wearing mushroom t-shirts. So it's been a little uh, strange for folks like me uh, who have been into mushrooms for a while. Uh, but it's also been very gratifying and rewarding to be able to uh, talk about my favorite things to so many people. Mm -hmm. And what do you think it is that is making fungi <laughs> so popular? I think a lot of it has to do with the mystery of fungi. Uh, there is just a lot of stuff we don't know about mushrooms. Not very many people know very much about them or how to identify them. So I think that that is something that people get really excited about. Um, new species of fungi are being found all the time, and there's just a lot to learn about mushrooms. So the fact that there are all these different angles that people can uh, approach learning about mushrooms from, I think that is a lot of its appeal. And of course, a lot of wild mushrooms are delicious and there are lots of foodies in the world who are looking for that next awesome flavor that you can't just go to the store and buy. Mm -hmm. We have Chris in St. Louis who uh, can relate a little bit to this. Chris, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hi, how are you guys? Great. So I, Great. I just wanted to share that my my brother and I, we've been into mushroom hunting uh, for about five years. And just by collecting chanterelles, morels, oyster mushrooms, uh, we would put them in buckets of water and we would spread the spores in our backyard. And now we, after a couple of years, we actually have chanterelles and morels growing in our backyard. And how do you like to enjoy them, Chris? Uh, my brother likes to fry them up um, in butter, salt, pepper. Um, that's the best way to cook chanterelles, right. in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you so much for calling, Chris. Mike, is what you're hearing from Chris common, um, that people are not only hunting for wild mushrooms, but also cultivating them where they live? So it's not extremely common. Uh, the results can be hit or miss with that type of approach, but I think it's important to consistently do what Chris was talking about and kind of introduce the, uh, those mushroom species to your environment where you want to grow them. But there has been a huge uh, uptick in interest in cultivating mushrooms in general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cultivated mushrooms were, of course, originally wild mushrooms. Right. And speaking of cultivation, Mike, you live in the Rala area. What kinds of mushrooms do you look for there? Oh, gosh, we have a lot of wonderful mushrooms. Uh, this time of year, the, the early summer uh, and through the summer, if there's enough rain, are some of my favorite times to hunt for mushrooms. Of course, there are the beautiful chanterelles that can be quite abundant. Uh, there's the wonderful black trumpet that was the mushroom that started it all for me. <laughs> uh, of course, there are all kinds of other wonderful fungi that are not just edible, but just beautiful and, and cryptic and mysterious. So we have a lot of fun uh, just engaging and learning about all the different variety that we find. Mm -hmm. And is there a certain technique that's involved in mushroom searching and collection? Um, not really a technique, but I do find that most people, uh, kind of like how I mentioned I was, are not really tuned into fungi, maybe just don't notice them or, or really don't understand all the amazing ecological interactions that fungi are a part of. Um, so I think that just kind of delving deeper into the function of fungi and what they're doing really helps to, uh, to find them more. And of course, it also uh, grows your interest in learning more about them. Mm -hmm. And where is it that you are searching? So it kind of depends on what kind of mushrooms you want, but the best thing to do is just get into the forest. Uh, a lot of mushrooms are associated with trees. Uh, so if there are, if there's a forest with lots of living trees and also lots of uh, dead and decaying stumps and trees laying on the ground, any kind of forest like that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. We are blessed with a large amount of public land here in Missouri. So you can hit Mark Twain National Forest or uh, any of the conservation areas or state parks. All of those are excellent places to look for fungi. So we're going to take a very quick break here, but we will be back shortly to continue this conversation with Mike Snyder. And we'll learn why folks are sending Missouri mushrooms to Indiana. A hint, it has to do with DNA. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio.
If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Welcome back. Mike, before the break, we were talking about wild mushrooms and then also cultivating at home. And so before we move on to the the topic of DNA, I'm wondering, are there any things that people should be keeping in mind about what they collect and then maybe trying to bring it back for cultivation? Yeah, so if you want to cultivate mushrooms that you find in the wild, you're going to need uh, kind of a, a lab set up at home to probably do that. Um, so usually the, the hunt is on for mushrooms that only grow in the wild uh, rather than trying to cultivate them at home. Mm-hmm. And with this collection in mind, you are in charge of the Missouri Mycological Society's research committee. And something new that you've been asking members to do this year is to actually collect samples of the mushrooms they find not for cultivation, but for science and for research. Can you give us an introduction to this project? What is it exactly that you are asking folks to do? Right, yeah. So we are really excited to uh, be offering uh, this project this year for everyone to take part in being a citizen scientist. So it's as simple as going out into the forest, taking a hike at a local park or somewhere, and whenever you see a mushroom, take some good quality photographs of it uh, from a few different angles, and you would uh, upload that observation to an app such as Mushroom Observer or also uh, iNaturalist is the main one that people use. Mm. And that helps us keep track of the data and also the photographs are there. Um, And then they would take those samples home after carefully collecting them, take them home, dehydrate them until cracker crisp, and then they mail them to me. And I put them in with all of the bulk collections that we have made and I send them off uh, to Mycota Labs, who is doing our uh, DNA sequencing for this project. Mm -hmm. And Mycota Labs is in Indiana, and we're joined also by the lab's founder and president, Steve Russell. Steve is also the founder of the nonprofit Hoosier Mushroom Society. Steve, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you have been doing this collecting of mushroom DNA from several states, which now include Missouri. What is the goal of this project? Yeah, our current goal is to really document all of the macrofungal diversity, all of the mushrooms that exist really across North America. And so we only know a small percentage of the total uh, species that are likely to exist to this point. And one of the best ways we can discover new species and distinguish one species from another is through DNA research. Mm-hmm. Now, there are a lot of people who can identify mushrooms. Isn't that enough to go with, you know, with what's already been ID'd as a species of fungi that exists in Missouri? I mean, in other words, like, why do we need DNA? Yeah, so the, the, the closer that we look at a lot of the past species descriptions, the more we realize there's a lot of work left to do. So I wouldn't be surprised if most of the species uh, that are identified in most field guides that are in print today, uh, I often say they won't withstand the test of time. So over the course of time, most of those names will likely change. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons for that is uh, early on within the science of mycology in North America, there were a lot of Europeans that came to North America and described species and used, uh, applied European names to our North American species. Mm-hmm. And we're finding out through DNA that while they might be closely related, they're actually different species that we have here in North America. Right. Is there an example that you can provide of where that kind of you know, misnomer was applied? <laughs> So uh, there was just some discussions on chanterelles a second ago. Mm -hmm. And most of the yellow golden chanterelles um, in North America went under a single uh, scientific name. And now we're discovering that there are probably dozens of different species that were all hidden under that one European species name. Mm -hmm. And what practical consequences does that have? So my, my, my primary interest is ecological research. Mm-hmm. So I'm really interested in things like, you know, symbiotic relationships, uh, how things connect in nature. Um, but there's a range of different uh, possibilities from um, biotechnology to medicine. 
Um, fungi are little miniature chemical factories, and they produce lots of interesting compounds that have lots of potential uses for humanity. Mm -hmm. Steve, there are more than 14,000 species of mushrooms, but scientists believe that there are many more to the order of millions more species. Why is it that we know so little about such a prodigiously common part of our natural world? So one thing to keep in mind that while we see uh, a mushroom fruiting out in the forest, that's just the reproductive, reproductive structure of the fungus. Mm -hmm. Most types of fungi are microscopic. So things like yeasts and muts, uh, smuts and molds and mildews. And um, they're very difficult to collect. Some of them we can't even culture yet. And that's where, when we're talking about millions of species, most of them are going to be the microscopic ones. There's mm -hmm. not going to be millions of species of mushrooms. Right. Uh, I, would, I would guess in North America, there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 species of mm -hmm. mushrooms. So that's still a very large number and lot, lots left to discover. But yeah, when, when we talk about millions of species of fungi, most of them are going to be microscopic. Right. So has this project already brought about discovery of new species of fungi? Yeah, one of the best things about mushroom hunting, and especially when you incorporate DNA into it, is basically every time you go out into the woods, if you make a few collections, odds are one of the species that you collect is going to be brand new to science. Uh, that's how common it is to find new species. Basically, mm -hmm. every trip into the woods, um, there's not only the possibility, but the likelihood of finding something that hasn't been described yet within the scientific literature. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. So with this project, I mean, you've set some pretty lofty goals. And one of them includes a, quote, comprehensive biodiversity survey of all macro fungi. So that's all of the mushrooms ever? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the goal. Really, uh, the, the longer term goal we've kind of spec'd it out over the next 10 years is when we think we can accomplish this um, for most of North America. We usually phrase as a reasonably complete uh, survey of macro fungi that exist. But uh, yeah, that's our current goal. And we're happy to have Missouri be a major part of that. Mm -hmm. And what will it take to get to to that point of you know, reasonable uh, discovery? How long will the project run? Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be about 10 years at this point is what we think we can do, but it's really dependent upon the total number of collectors and the number of collections that we get in that we're able to analyze. And that's why the help of um, with Mike and the Missouri Mycological Society is more important and getting the word out that there's a place where people can send unknown mushrooms to to actually get some DNA work done on them and to get, you know, a semi-final result on what the species is going to be. Mm -hmm. And Steve, you know, you've been a mycologist in Indiana for quite some time. What is it that inspired you to start the MycoMap project and for the lab there to be a destination for fungi DNA? Yeah, so for me, it's really the thrill of discovery. You know, so I, I almost consider myself like a biological explorer. Um, you know, most of the, the planet has been, the land area, the geography has been explored to this point. But we still have a lot to do in terms of just documenting the species that are out there and the interactions between species and, you know, what's their role on this planet. So, Mike, uh, you are focused on mycology here in Missouri. How is it that people here in this state can get involved with Steve's project? Do they have to be members of the Missouri Mycological Society? No. I would prefer that they be members of the Missouri Mycological Society, but no. <laughs> the best way would be to check out the website, mycomapmo.org, M-Y-C-O-M-A-P-M-O.org, and that will take you to a fantastic uh, webpage that Mycota Labs has created, and it shows you exactly how to take collections and how you can uh, get involved mm -hmm. and be a part of this research. You know, as far as the research part goes, do you think that there are already sort of character traits among those who are fungi fans um, that also make them great for, for partnership with this kind of a, of a project? Yes, absolutely. What a great question. I think that if you're already into mushrooms, contributing to this project is a no-brainer. Uh, you're already in the woods. You're already kind of keyed into them and noticing them. So it's only one more step to collect them and dry them and send them in. Steve, I understand that you are traveling back 
uh, from Canada, where you attended the annual conference of the Mycological Society of North America. So you've been hanging out with um, fungi scientists, not fungi, but fungi, and you've been doing that for a few days. Are there any sh- takeaways that you can share uh, from the world of mycology that sort of, you know, will maybe pull more people into uh, foraging for fungi and sharing information that will expand sort of our, our base of knowledge about them? Yeah, I would say one of the things within ecological research that's really expanding right now is um, scientists looking at environmental DNA. And so if you take a sample of soil, you can look at all of the DNA that exists in that soil, including all of the mushrooms, and know what species exist in an environment even if they aren't fruiting at the given time. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a really expanding area of research at this point. But we really need lots of physical collections with photographs of all of these things to put the faces on all of that environmental DNA that people are sequencing at this point. And that's going to be one of the key long-term advantages of a project like this is we're going to be able to really um, put thousands of faces uh, to these things that would otherwise only be known by their DNA sequence in the environment. Mm -hmm. And as we wrap here, last question for each of you. Is there a, a mushroom that always, when you come upon it in the wild, just gives you, again, that feeling that you had the first time you found uh, a mushroom that was new to you? Uh, For me, I definitely feel that way every time I find a hen of the woods or Griffola frondosa. Mm -hmm. Certainly not a rare mushroom, uh, but it's just one of the coolest mushrooms. They're huge, and uh, I always do a dance when I find one. (laughs) Great. (laughs) And Steve? Yeah, my, I have a favorite group of mushrooms, and that's probably amanitas. And really, you know, they, they range from small to large, but really most of the time I find them, even if they're common ones, it really gives me lots of joy. Mm-hmm. Steve, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.